Succes ved at nær praksis, podcast nummer 98. Hej og velkommen til. Dyrlæge Søren Pejstrup her. Det er mig, der står bag projektet Succes ved nær praksis. Det er en podcast som den her, en hjemmeside med et e-mail, nyhedsbrev og nogle online kurser, som alle sammen fokuserer på at levere komprimeret læring til danske dyrlæger og veterinære sygeplejersker. Og jeg er utrolig stolt over i dag at kunne præsentere en af verdens førende kompetencer inden for dermatologi. Og vi bruger lidt tid på at gå igennem en af de her patienttyper, som vi alle sammen ser i praksis, hvad enten vi vil eller ej, eller hvad enten vi har styr på dem eller ej, så er der noget at komme efter i den her episode. Og så kan jeg ikke lade være sådan lige at bemærke, at det er nummer 98. Der er en tilbage, så når vi nummer 100. Da jeg for lidt over to år siden tænkte, nu vil jeg prøve at lave en podcast, så tænkte jeg, nu laver jeg 20, så ser vi, hvor det fører hen. Og så pludselig så sidder vi her 100 episoder senere. De fleste af dem er lidt længere end den her. Den her episode, den var måske små 40 minutter, og mange af dem, de var en times tid, eller lige under i hvert fald, så det er forholdsvis mange timer, der er gået i det her, men der er altså også virkelig mange gode episoder iblandt, og nummer 100, det bliver en, som vi i fællesskab skal skabe, det bliver en, hvor jeg tager nogle af de bedste podcast frem, og så, hvis du er ny i, til, for podcasten her, så er det i hvert fald et rigtig godt sted at starte, for der får du i hvert fald de 4-5 bedste af de podcast, der er udgivet her i Succesvitaren nær praksis nogensinde. Men det kan vi også tage mere i næste episode igen. Jeg kan i hvert fald, jeg er i hvert fald svært ved lige andet end at bemærke, at det godt nok er fartroende tæt på nu her. Der er links og noter til dagens afsnit, ligesom der altid er. Det her er nummer 98, så noterne finder du på sivp.dk-98 sivp.dk-98 Kig derover, der er links også til Sus online tjeneste, og så er der selvfølgelig listet de her stoffer op, som Sue hun nævner, så du ikke enten kører i grøften eller drætter af løbebåndet, hvis du prøver at skrive det her ned i farten. Kig over på hjemmesiden, der er det alle sammen samlet, og så over til interviewet med Sue. Hej Sue, and welcome to the podcast. Hej. Uh, thank you for taking the time out to talk to us. I know you are an extremely uh, busy person, and uh, you are also a, a well-known expert in our field, uh, especially for those who are interested in dermatology. But in the odd case, there's someone out there who don't know who you are. Can you please give us a, maybe a short introduction to who you are? Uh, okay, so I'm a full-time veterinary dermatologist. Um, I'm a British and I'm a European specialist in veterinary dermatology. Um, I enjoy all aspects of the disease. I particularly enjoy obviously managing allergy and of course ear disease. Um, I've recently launched a dermatology telemedicine service, which is very exciting, which is going to be aimed to give vets assistance in managing their own cases in their own practices. Um, so that's just started, and we're very pleased with the way it's been received. Yeah. Um, and how do you do telemedicine for dermatology? Well, interestingly, there was a there was a paper published in the states. I think it was last year, showing that human pediatric uh, dermatologists can identify uh, dermatology conditions in children accurately in more than eighty percent of cases. So dermatologists who are experienced. Um, can usually identify a skin problem just through photos. So the large part of the site will be people submitting photos and some history, and then we'll give them advice on differential diagnosis, diagnostic tests, and therapeutic regimes. So we've been we've been really really excited how well it's gone so far, and um, I'm working with some fantastically talented dermatologists, so we can cover pretty much everything from snakes and hamsters <laughs> all the way through to, to hippos. So we've got exotic specialists there as well. So, yeah, it's going very well. Very well. Very pleased with it. Exciting. Yes. Okay, uh, that's a brand new world to me, but of course uh, hippos can have dermatology <laughs> problems as well, but <laughs> I haven't well, seen one, though. Well, of course, Malassezia pachydermatis was first identified in pachyderm, so we know they get yeast infections, uh, yeah. at the very least. Of course. 
So, but maybe we should stick to uh, uh, the more furry ones uh, that I know. <laughs> uh, mainly dogs. I uh, have to be honest, I don't see too many um, um, cats with uh, other skin problems that from fleas. So, uh, uh, I'm expecting that we are going to talk uh, mostly about dogs. I mean, I think really, as far as cats are concerned, almost all cats get flea allergies if you're in an area, of course, where you have fleas or other exoparasites. And that's always your rule out before you start looking at atopy in cats. It's a much rarer disease in the cat than it ever is in the dog. Yeah. Uh, I've talked uh, to other persons here on the podcast on how to diagnose and how to arrive at the diagnosis of atopy. So uh, maybe um, uh, it's going to be too much to to cover that as well. But uh, maybe just for a, a minute or two, can you give us uh, the brief over, overview on, on um, what it is that you call or maybe define as atopy or what kind of si- symptoms it, it covers? I mean, atopic dermatitis is really a diagnosis of exclusion. So um, when people do things like allergy testing, allergy testing is really only to help in the management of the disease. So essentially, you rule out ectoparasites, you rule out uh, cutaneous adverse food reactions, what we used to call food allergy, you rule out ectoparasites, you rule out infection. And if you've still got a dog that's pyritic and particularly if they've got pruritus directed at those predilection areas, so areas like the feet and the flexural aspects, particularly the axilla, the groin, particularly if they've got um, otitis externa, then it's very likely that's going to be a dog who's got atopic dermatitis. So Mm. it's it's not a diagnosis you need to be a dermatologist to make. Anybody in practice can make make a diagnosis. But despite the fact we've got some fabulous new drugs about now, you still do need to go through that tick list of investigation before you reach for some of these fabulous antipyritic drugs that we've got. It's really, really important. Would you need the blood samples, the the allergy, allergy screen testing, before you make the diagnosis? No, absolutely, definitely not. If that if that dog is still itchy, still pruritic, after you've ruled out your parasites and food and infection, that dog really must have atopic dermatitis. And so the blood sampling really is to help you identify the allergens, which may help in environmental modification to avoid things they're allergic to. Or is there, of course, if you want to make up um, vaccines, so allergen-specific immunotherapy, which I, I think sadly has been a little bit lost in the in the sort of mix when we're looking at control of allergies. It's still a very, very useful form of treatment and a very cost-effective form of treatment in a lot of dogs. Yeah, uh, I work in GP, so I see a lot of different cases and I'm uh, fairly certain that I miss uh, uh, some details uh, because of uh, maybe my lack of knowledge. But I find some of these case, cases to be a little frustrating and maybe that's uh, what we're going to talk about today as well. But uh, when we do um, some of this allergy screening uh, and we uh, have vaccines made for them, it doesn't quite work as well as I'd like them to or maybe there's just just because I haven't worked them out probably or uh, I'm missing a, a in important detail or something. But I, um, for my own uh, case, I can see I can say that uh, it's uh, lost. Uh, they lost in favor because uh, I don't um, uh, don't see I them think, work as well. And I think that's because whenever you use a vaccine, what you you have to do first, and you may well do this is you need to make the dog comfortable first. So if you have a pruritic dog, you need to get that dog under control, and that may be using prednisolone, it may be using opnisipilib, so something like Apoquel. Um, You need to control its pruritus, you need to control its infection. You add your vaccine in, and then you taper your other medication off. But of course, if that dog's prone to infection, Often the vaccine won't have complete control of the infection, so you need to perhaps maintain some topical treatment as well. And of course, often once you start, dogs on vaccines, clients forget about diet and they forget about parasite control. So it's it's a complete package. It's, it's what's often referred to as this multimodal therapy mm-hmm. when you're looking at atopic dermatitis. Lots of different ways in which you can control these dogs. And often if you rely on one treatment, that's where you become a little bit unstuck, I think. Yes, and that's actually uh, 
where the frustration comes in with me because I, I want to give them one antibiotics and then get rid of the disease and maybe that's why um, I do more surgery <laughs> because I can yeah. cut the problem off and then it's gone and, uh, and but yeah, that's maybe I mean, a personal thing yeah, yeah I mean, it's a bit it's a bit like it's a bit like controlling an epileptic I always say to clients you know when your animal is under control That doesn't mean to say you stop the medication. It means to say you jump up and down and go, great, those are the drugs my dog needs to stay on now long term. You mm -hmm. know, an epileptic is only controlled as long as they're having their, their drugs. So it's, it's an ongoing treatment, yeah. uh, a lifetime of treatment, sadly, for yeah. these dogs. Yeah. So um, maybe for definition purposes, uh, what do you define as an um, atopic flare-up? So an atopic flare-up is where a dog has been controlled and then for some reason they become pyritic again. Uh, and there are so many different reasons why that can then actually happen. So it's where the client phones you and says, the vaccine's not working, the Apoquil's not working, um, the steroids aren't working, and they lost control of their, their dog's skin condition for one reason or another. Yeah. And um, maybe that's uh, a bit uh, of a story from real life, but I have um, some patients that we don't, we are not c completely sure that they are allergic, uh, but they are some uh, somewhat managed on uh, a, a different uh, pet food. They have read something online and found something grain free, and then the dog is is okay, sort of, and it gets some flea treatment once in a while, and then suddenly. Uh, one summer afternoon, it, it uh, it's completely red all over. Um, would that count as well, even though we are not absolutely. completely sure? Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, uh, of course it can. And of course, that can happen for all sorts of reasons. It may be, we know that a lot of these dogs with atopic dermatitis are much more susceptible to contact types of allergies. Many of these dogs are irritated, for example, by things like cut grass. So it may well be that they've come into contact with something that's caused an irritant type of reaction and that's triggered off their allergy. Maybe they've been um, bitten by a, by a parasite. Maybe they've eaten something when they've been out. You know, dogs, mm -hmm. I've got Labradors, will eat things when they're out. Sometimes things you don't even see because they're gone in an instant. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> Anything can anything can cause these flare-ups. Sometimes they're, they're very subtle. It may be, you know, um, a change in the weather. And one of the things that I would recommend clients is if they have a dog who has been shown to have pollen allergies, I'll get them to monitor the pollen count. They can do that very easily on the internet. And that can give them some degree of predictability as to how their dog's going to be on a day-to-day -day basis. I find that very useful. Yeah. Um, can it, can you maybe give us an overview on how you approach these uh, patients? Because I, I usually get a little worried that I've, uh, as I said, missed something and these dogs come in and I know that we haven't done the, the complete uh, straightforward allergy testing and the uh, food elimination trial is probably not done as well as it could be. And, and, and I worry there's a ghost somewhere in the, in the mix as well, but... Can you give us an uh, an approach uh, on, on how you uh, sure. give us an overview of how you approach I mean, these? I mean, certainly I think when you, you get a case like this, um, it's, it's difficult because often a client will phone you up on a Friday afternoon or they'll phone you up on a Sunday morning and you're expected to produce you know advice over the phone. I don't think there's anything wrong in the short term in adjusting therapy. So if you have an animal potentially that's on a low dose of prednisolone, it may be you want to increase that prednisolone for a couple of days and get them to report back or to check it if that client can't get into the surgery, because that's often the case. You know, either because they have got things to do in their busy life or there's, they can't transport the animal in. But certainly if it's going on for more than a couple of days, I'd want to reassess that dog. And you just need to visually assess it because we know that atopic dermatitis is not essentially a disease that produces primary lesions. Occasionally you may see the odd macule or papule, but generally speaking, you won't see primary lesions. And often these flares are due to infection. So you need to check this dog all over, see if there's any evidence of pyoderma on its ventrum. Often they'll get into digital uh, lesions where they'll get superficial infection, surface colonization with yeast or bacteria. So visual assessment is really important first. 
and and you need to chat to the owner. You need to you know, have you stopped using the fleet control? Because often they, they, they do. Have you stopped using your weekly chlorhexidine shampoo? Um, have you stopped your flea control? Because often this, they, they're lulled into a sense of false security when that dog is stable and they stop doing something that they've been doing on a regular basis. If they haven't done anything like that, and if the dog doesn't have infection, then I would use a short-acting antipyritic agent to settle that dog down. And then you've got lots of, do- lots of drugs that you may want to choose to actually do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and can you... Uh What kind of drugs do you use? I think it depends on depends on the dog, depends on the client, depends on the dog's clinical history. Um, but certainly something like prednisolone would be very good. We also have oclacitinib, which is an apoquel, which is which is very good. And of course, we have Loki Vetmap, which of course is Cytopoint. So all of those will offer offer really short, sharp courses of treatment to bring that animal under control. So I I, I say depends on the case which of those I might choose. Um, if the dog's good with tablets, a, a five day course of prednisolone may be more than adequate. Just at anti inflammatory dose rates of one milligram per kilogram, and often that will just hit that animal hard. Mm-hmm. And you will uh, treat so, the, uh, the. Sorry. Yeah. I'm asthmatic, mm-hmm. and when I have an asthmatic flare, I need to put my medication up intensively for five days, mm-hmm. and it brings my asthma back under control. And I use that analogy to talk to clients to say, you know, this isn't that this drug isn't working. It's just that you know the current regime, the dog's had an acute flare. We need to give it a short, sharp course of medication to bring it back under control, and then we cut it back down to maintenance therapies after that. So it's it's something that works acutely, and that's why. In those situations, although I like cyclosporin as a drug for atopic dermatitis, and certainly antihistamines will help some dogs, they're not suitable for acute flares because they do not work quick enough. Yeah. They really aren't the sort of drug you should be reaching for. Uh, so that's a, a fair way to s- start them. If uh, I'm not completely sure that uh, that we are on the right track, uh, track, just to get the patient or the patient's skin under control. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And uh, you talk about the treating the surface infections as well? Absolutely. I mean, so many of these allergic dogs are prone to superficial bacterial infection. Um, I use a lot of topical treatment um, in, U- in the UK, and I'm sure it's the same in other parts of Europe. We're very aware of antibiotic use, and so I will use chlorhexidine before I would ever reach for an antibiotic. I use the shampoos a lot. I also like the mousses. So we've got a lot of the mousse available in the UK. And again, I know they're available in other parts of Europe. So yeah. three or four percent chlorhexidine mousse just used on predilection areas once or twice a week, I think is really useful. It's quick. It's easy for clients to do. And if they have a, an acute flare, you can just use chlorhexidine daily to bring things under control. It's 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 not a difficult thing to do. And and at what point uh, would you think antibiotics, systemic antibiotics, are a good idea? How much? Uh, I would I would I would very rarely use systemic antibiotics. Um, I mean, if I see an animal who's got a severe generalized infection, then I may may consider it. And what I'll often do is when they'll come in, is I'll do some cytology to uh, check it's got a pyoderma. So that will be assessing a primary lesion, an impression smear from a crust, something like that. I may take a culture from it. I may send that culture away or I may store it in the fridge for future reference. I'll start that animal on chlorhexidine and then I'll reassess them. If it's not making progress, you've got the option to send the swab away or you've got the option to add some systemic antibiotics in. But what's important, I think, is the conversation that you have with the client to stress the importance of not using antibiotics because what I always say to them is, you know, if we use them now when we really need them, they might not actually work. So I, I try hard not to. If I do have to... I have to say my drug of choice would be cephalexin, an absolute minimum of three weeks, 25 milligrams per kilogram, twice a day for that period of time. And I would treat until I have no evidence of primary lesions present. But that's a quite long time compared to what I've uh, have, what I have been used to. 
Um, yep, it's it's what I would would expect to use for a superficial pyoderma. So if you have a folliculitis, when we've obviously got infection in the follicles, or we've got an impetigo, when it's uh, not in the follicles, it's in the skin between the follicles, I would expect you to use three weeks of treatment. I, I think using l less than that, and first of all, you're less likely to clear the infection, and also I would suggest you're more likely to predispose this animal to developing um, re resistant bacteria, particularly methicillin resistant. Mm. Um, I, I rarely prescribe antibiotics now for superficial infection. Um, you can manage pretty much all of these with topical treatment. Okay. Yeah, we, we just had a, a new um, guideline for rational uh, antibiotic use, um, and that's in all areas or all organs uh, but there's of course a, a chapter on skin as well and it's very well done and it it also it says the, it's the same thing don't ever don't use it if you can ever avoid it and uh, and and that's a uh, uh, that's of course good but then uh, i have to talk to the owner and the, the owner just stands there with the hands in the pocket and she says can you just fix it for me and make it go away and i yeah well <laughs> and i uh, it's, uh, yeah. and it's and it's difficult and it really is difficult because there is there is a a real necessity sometimes for owners to go away clutching a prescription for antibiotics or a little bag with antibiotics in so it's much more difficult not to give antibiotics than to give antibiotics but you just need to have that conversation and I think what's really important is when you get that dog in you perhaps need to, to get a feel for that owner's lifestyle and what you're going to ask them to do so you know you can assess your clients and, and By the time you get to that conversation about topical therapy, you can have a fairly good idea if they're going to be someone who will shampoo their Newfoundland twice a week or whether they're going to be someone who, <laughs> yeah. who probably won't shampoo their Newfoundland twice a week. So it, 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 it's, it's very much an individual basis. Yeah. You know? Now, um, there are some people who will cope with it much better, some people who are much more compliant than others. Uh, and of course, you know, it's very different shampooing a West Highland White Terrier to a, to a giant breed. So okay. there has to be individual variation. But you still need to have that conversation. I think responsibly, we need to have that conversation every single time we're considering antibiotic use. Yeah. But I, what, what I also get from this is that you would much rather use anti-inflammatory and then some topical treatment, uh, then uh, go straight for the antibiotics. Always, yeah. 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 If, it, if it's a deep pyoderma, then I think that would be very different. If I'm getting a rods on cytology rather than cocky on cytology, again, that would be different. But in almost all of these cases, this is going to be staph pseudintermediates that we're dealing with. So you're going to get cocky on cytology and therefore topical treatment, I think, is completely appropriate. Yeah, good. And what? Why do you use uh, prednisolone instead of? Um, and I always have trouble saying these. Uh, uh, Oxfordsitinib. Yes, thank you. Yes, I I too struggle to say why. Um, I I actually don't think there's much difference between the two, but prednisolone is is quite cheap. Um, and if you're looking at a treatment that you're going to give for five days and providing there is no contraindication for prednisolone, I have no problem with giving five days of prednisolone. I mean, it's it's a drug which has fallen a little by the wayside. Uh, steroids are very, very effective anti-inflammatory drugs, providing you're using them for the right the right reason. So I, I have no problems with that. But, you know, um, octanacitalib, oh, Let's let's go for Apoquel. So Apoquel <laughs> is Apoquel is actually just as good. You obviously won't see the polyuria in the polydipsia that you will see with steroids. But we're looking at five days, so it's yeah. they're interchangeable for me. Okay, um, and if we have a, a patient that we uh, think is fairly good, um, uh, the workup has been fairly good, and it's. Uh, on um, Apoquel for or has been for some time and it, it makes um, a flare-up as well. Would you use uh, prednisolone for that as well on top of Apoquel? I, th I think it, if it's flared on Apoquel, the chances are it's probably developed a pyoderma. So what I would generally do with those animals is I will say to the client that we may have to make it a little bit worse before we make it better i would gen and because apoquel is immunosuppressive it's it's quite a potent drug in that respect what i would generally do is i will 
take it off the upper quell, treat the pyoderma, and then I would put it back on the upper quell. I think if upper quell has not controlled it, there is something else there other than pruritus. And switching to the prednisolone usually won't work. So I would go back to my basics. I'd reassess the case, work out why it's flared, because it's unusual to see a dog flare on upper quell unless there's another reason for the pruritus other than allergy. Yeah. Um, and um, would you? Um, I'm going to circle a little bit about uh, Apoquel. I know you have been using it for some time. It's fairly new here in Denmark. I think okay. it's with, within a, a year that it's been registered for use here. Um, so uh, we don't have too much experience with it, but uh, and we also uh, we know that it's uh, similar to prednisolone, but we don't know if uh, we're supposed to taper off our patients or if we can just stop them right off and then <laughs> uh, shift them uh, where our how our patients would behave if we do all that kind of stuff um it's it's a very different drug to to prednisolone in that you really need to stay within the dose range to get get it to be effective certainly in my experience if you cut the dose rate down uh, beyond the recommended dose rate, often you will lose control of the animal, whereas often with um, prednisolone, you can taper that down from your one milligram per kilogram down to much, much lower lower levels. So for me, for, for Apoquel, um, I, I haven't had a lot of success in, for example, in moving Apoquel onto alternate day. Um, what we've been able to do is move them about within the dose range, um, but we haven't been able to actually switch them in the same way they've been able to switch them with prednisolone. You don't need to taper it, though. I mean, you can stop and start it straight away. So if a dog has a flare, you can just give them Apoquel. And certainly um, there are cases where I may have a dog on allergen-specific immunotherapy, and that client may have a small quantity of Apoquel. And what I will say to them is, you know, if your dog has a flare, give it Apoquel, give it Apoquel daily for five days, and if it doesn't settle down, contact me. So we have clients who have it there as a short, sharp burst, again, for those acute flares when potentially their vaccine doesn't control them. If, for example, the pollen count has, has, has risen very steeply, if there's a period of warm warm weather, for example. But it's, it's a remarkably safe drug, um, providing you don't give it to animals who have disease where um, Apoquel could exacerbate it. So obviously dogs with history of neoplasia, dogs with underlying infection, dogs with a history of dermatocosis. But for your uncomplicated atopic, it's a really very, very good drug indeed. Okay. And uh, where does uh, the other one... Uh, I would, point? Yeah. I would try to say the uh, the real name of it. Uh, L- instead the of Lucky Vet Map. Yeah. Um, I, um, that's, obviously, that's a lot more specific than the um, Apoquel, because Apoquel can be used more generally in allergic skin disease, whereas Cytopoint is more specifically for atopic dermatitis because of its mode of action. Um, I actually, if I if I have to have a preference, my preference is for Cytopoint. I think it is a, a fabulous drug. It's a very safe drug because it's very specific in its mode of action. Um, it's, it's some, obviously this this um, monoclonal antibody, it it tends to control pruritus very specifically. And unlike Apoquel or steroids or or indeed cyclosporin for that matter, you can give it to a dog if it's got underlying disease such as, for example, a pyoderma. So I would be comfortable giving Cytopoint with a dog with a pyoderma because it will you can still continue to control the infection but not cause any problems with exacerbation with side point so i really really like it and again it's really useful for acute flares you get these animals in you can assess them and even if it's got a pyoderma you can treat that pyoderma side to point and you'll bring it under control and then often you'll then find that this underlying medication whatever it's been on before Oh, sorry, Sue. I, I lost you for a second there. You can you can manage the atopic flare with Cytopoint, You said. Yeah, because um, Cytopoint is, works in a very different way. Cytopoint doesn't tend to have any sort of significant immunosuppressive effects. 
that you would see with something like a glucocorticoid or like Apoquel. And so if you have a dog who has an acute flare and they've got pyoderma present, you can actually give Cytopoint at the same time and also institute antibiotic therapy or better still, topical um, antibacterial therapy. So it's a really, really useful drug for these acute flares. And certainly um, you, can, you can use it in lots of different ways. You can use it for ongoing treatment, but it lends itself beautifully to supporting those dogs during the periods of the year when their allergy is unstable. So historically, if you look back through an animal's history, you will see that many of these dogs are bad perhaps for two months in the summer, perhaps for a few months in the winter. And that would be when you can use your cytopoint just to go in as a short, sharp, you know, course, perhaps a couple of injections, just to give that animal a little bit of supplementary control. So I find it a really useful drug. Um, I, in my experience, very little in the way of side effects. The disadvantage for me, of course, is that unlike allergen-specific immunotherapy, so vaccines, which I will allow my clients to do at home, um, they're having to come into the surgery for the cytopoint injection. So that is disadvantage, but it's a very safe drug, very effective drug, and I, I think certainly it's the drug that's probably changed dermatology practice worldwide most significantly in the last probably 20 years it's an incredible yeah um is there anything else you use for for these kind of patients so say that again is there anything else that you use that you like us to know about for these uh, kind of cases i think the for acute flares um i think we probably covered the, the main things i think the other thing to think about for control is um is different types of vaccines because um, we traditionally have used the subcutaneous vaccines, but we've certainly started to look at the sublingual vaccines and they look really interesting. And there is evidence to suggest that if the subcutaneous vaccines don't work, the sublingual vaccines are certainly worth considering. They're a lot more labor intensive, but again, some clients find that easier. Um, they need to be given at least once, if not twice a day. And then the other thing which has also been used more extensively now is these intralymphatic vaccines. There's been several publications on those now, and they've come from Europe, from some of the Swiss groups. Mm -hmm. um, intralymphatic vaccines where the vaccines are actually put directly into a lymph node. So you're actually hitting the immune system with allergen in a much more specific way. And certainly there's been suggestions that Um, intensive courses of just perhaps three or four months have managed to put some dogs into remission for long periods of time. So again, if I have a dog which I know is perhaps going to have acute flares during the summer, perhaps we've struggled to them, control them in previous years, uh, the intralymphatic vaccines may be something to consider perhaps as a three or four injection course starting early in the new year to see if you can push that dog into remission for the summer months. And I think that's quite an exciting uh, new way to try and control these. And what that means potentially is you may have a dog that's drug-free during the summer, during their high-risk period of time, by just giving them the injections earlier on in the year. Yeah. So I think vaccines, vaccines I think, will will certainly, and I know a lot of people are looking at vaccines in detail, trying to make them much more specific in their mode of action. And I do think we'll see a lot more. And I do think we'll see a lot more in the way of monoclonal antibodies, the, the way that medicine is moving. I I cannot believe that we'll not see more of that type of drug um, as we move forward. But um, I, this is my maybe a, a more personal point, uh, or maybe a little bit off topic, off topic but uh, do you feel that there's still going to be uh, the need for vaccines if I can just uh, put some cytopoint in it and then uh, they're done with it <laughs> and maybe don't care too much about how it's allergic or what it's allergic to? I mean, the, 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 there's no doubt about it. Cytopoint's fab. But the incentive that you have with the vaccine is there is certainly evidence in the literature and certainly I have personal experience where you have animals that you put on allergen-specific immunotherapy and you can, in inverted commas, cure these animals. They can come off treatment. So it's the only form of treatment where realistically you have got the chance of actually you know, being able to put that dog into remission for prolonged periods of time. Mm -hmm. The other thing too is, certainly in the UK, 
um, these new drugs are fab, but they are expensive. And, you know, there is no doubt about it that for some uh, clients, uh, something like Cytopoint is prohibitively expensive, particularly if it's a big dog. And allergen-specific immunotherapy is still a much lower cost alternative. It's still very safe. Um, and what I will often do with some of these difficult cases is start them off on Apoquel or start them off on Cytopoint with a vaccine and then try and taper my Cytopoint or my Apoquel down. And again, just using that drug for the acute flares to supplement my, my vaccine. The other thing too, of course, is that you know, we've already said Apoquel isn't safe if an animal has a concurrent problem. So if you have a dog with um, demodicosis, then Apoquel is not a drug I would want to use. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think as far as controlling atopic dermatitis is concerned, the fantastic thing that we have now as veterinary surgeons and as veterinary dermatologists is we have, we have choice, you know, and there is no one drug which controls every animal. Um, we have got so many options for clients. And I think it's quite nice, you know, if you, you are a busy clinician, perhaps to get yourself some, some information sheets. And when you're making decisions about therapy, sometimes worthwhile just you know providing your client with some information let them go home let them have a think about it because this is a decision that they're making on long-term treatment for their dog so it's worthwhile making sure they've got all the information and they can make an informed decision about the treatment that's most appropriate for their dog and also that fits their lifestyle i think that's got to be really important you know Yes, of course, and and I had a um, an old lady in <laughs> just the other day uh, with a, a fairly large dog, and uh, sending her home with the shampoo is not the um, uh, not going to help anybody, <laughs> especially Hello? not the dog. Absolutely, no. absolutely. So, so she may be a person who would suit side point therapy very nicely because yeah. she doesn't have to, you know, take on the responsibility of tableting her dog every day because she's probably taking tablets herself yeah and more than one of <laughs> probably of course yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, can, they can they can pill pop together yeah perfect and now uh, of course we uh, we can get your help uh, if we have a frustrating case and or if i'm not uh, certain that i uh, uh, the workup is done correctly so now i can take a picture and get your help right Well, not just not just me. There's there's a, there's another twelve dermatologists there as well as me. But yeah, absolutely. Um, anything like that. Um, good quality pictures. We can we can help to help people to manage these cases. Yeah, yeah. That's what we're that's what we're there for. It's to help people manage cases in their own clinics, because we realise that not everybody wants to refer a case. Not everybody can refer a case. So we're there to support vets in practice. We hope. Yeah. And uh, just once more, where uh, is a good? Uh, where's the right way to go to uh, learn more about the, your service and more about you? Uh, well, you don't want to learn any more about me. Um, but <laughs> learning more, about, learning more about the service. Um, our, our website is vetderms dot com, um, and it's set up to cover well the world. So it doesn't matter where you're based. We can pick up the stuff and we can give you advice. I'm afraid it will be in English for now. Um, but um, I would hope it should be useful advice for particularly some of these really difficult, challenging cases. Yeah, well, um, maybe that's going to be an, an issue for some owners, but I believe that most Danish veterinarians will be proficient enough in English to, to get it. So uh, I don't worry too much about it with, with my colleagues here in Denmark anyway. Good, yeah. good. Your English is much better than my Danish, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, probably it should be, I hope. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much, Sue, for taking uh, time out of your busy day to talk to us. It's been uh, very educational and uh, um, I can really sense that you're a, a skilled lecturer because um, you make it simple for us, uh, <laughs> us not dermatologist nerds, to, to get some of the points here. My absolute, my absolute pleasure. If we can help, um, please give us a shout. Du skal kigge over på hjemmesiden. Der finder du links og noter til dagens afsnit på sivp.dk-podcast. 
98. Der finder du også en lille boks, hvor du kan tilmelde dig nyhedsbrevet, og der får du også mere information om de her hudpatienter. Og vi snakker nemlig om, hvordan vi sådan lidt mere systematisk kan gå til dem, og det er måske især relevant, hvis ikke de her hudpatienter interesserer dig meget, fordi så har du brug for et framework, hvor du ligesom kan gå lidt hurtigt frem og kan komme lidt hurtigere i mål med dem her, så du ikke skal bøvle så meget med dem. Vi ses over på hjemmesiden og høres ved igen på næste søndag.